Hi everyone. Uh, our story continues today uh, with um, the next chapter in South African history, which is uh, the first European incursions. Um, and uh, this, of course, is going to have long lasting consequences um, that will culminate in uh, the apartheid state in the 20th century and in the multiracial nation uh, that emerged from that uh, later on. Um, South Africa was not much involved, uh, at least the land of South Africa, uh, not much involved in the voyages of discovery because, as we said in an earlier lecture, um, there are not a lot of natural harbors uh, in South Africa. Um, the Portuguese had, in over the course of the 15th century, explored much of the western coast of Africa, um, establishing a, a foothold um, in the Congo River Basin, um, in what is now Angola. Um, but they didn't really uh, take an interest in, in uh, the Cape uh, or in any part of South Africa or what became South Africa um, because of the, the lack of natural harbors. Uh, South Africa did play a role in a sense uh, in that, you know, when Bartholomew Diaz in the 1480s um, rounded the Cape of Good Hope and saw open ocean in front of him, realizing that this was the sea route to India. Uh, that that inspired a lot uh, of future discoveries. Um, Bosco da Gama in 1497 um, made his way around the Cape and all the way to India and, and managed to, you know, purchase some, um, uh, do some trade in India and return with two of his four ships to Portugal. Um, you know, South Africa played a role in that in a sense, right? The Cape uh, was a kind of geographic symbol of um, European progress. Uh, but Europeans really didn't um, weigh anchor in South Africa at any point uh, until the early 17th century, um, at least not for any extended period. Um, the British uh, and the Dutch, who emerged as the major world powers um, with their mercantile empires and their, you know, kind of growing navies and, and things like this uh, in the 17th century, um, were the first to think about taking an active interest in this. The British thought about annexing uh, the Cape of Good Hope um, in the early 17th century, but never took that step. It wasn't until 1652 that a uh, company of employees of the VOC, now this is, you can see on the slide here, the mat, the flag, I should say, um, of the VOC. Uh, this is otherwise known as the Dutch East India Company. The v VOC are the uh, letters uh, in Dutch uh, of the company. Um, I, a couple of years ago, had a Dutch student in my uh, African history class, and she obliged by, you know, telling us what the real words were. Um, let's suffice it to call it the VOC here, okay. Um, uh, the last word is company. Um, but uh, the Dutch East India Company was um, not, it was in some senses like modern corporations or a forerunner of modern corporations in that it had a great deal of autonomy, um, had shareholders, uh, was a multinational force, was involved in all sorts of different enterprises. Um, but it was also unlike modern corporations in that it constituted almost uh, a country in and of itself. Um, leaders of the VOC were given a tremendous amount of autonomy by the Dutch government to do things like, well, found colonies, uh, sign treaties, uh, even employ armies, um, and uh, in the 17th century, the VOC was one of the most powerful entities in the entire world. The most lucrative operations for the VOC were in the islands of what is now Indonesia, especially Java, uh, where they were extracting spices um, and shipping them off uh, to Europe. And so the VOC took an interest in the Cape, not for anything that the Cape itself had to offer, but because it was a convenient way station on the route between the Spice Islands or Indonesia um, and the Netherlands. 
Um, and so in 1652, a group of company employees led by a guy named Jan van Riebeck landed uh, at Table Bay uh, with the intention of founding a permanent settlement there. And over the course of the next couple of decades, they succeeded in doing this. Um, they founded what eventually became called Cape Town. And for the first part of its existence, the first few decades, in fact, of its existence, Cape Town was a company town, meaning it uh, did not have a government independent of the VOC. Jan von Riebeck was a uh, company um, uh, manager, as it were. Um, he was in the, the management, um, and all of the Dutch residents of Cape Town were company employees. However, after a few years, maybe 20 or so years, uh, the company released, and I'm, I'm really skipping over a lot of history here, I'm really just kind of hitting the, the high points or the highlights, um, uh, a few of the company employees were released from their employment contracts and allowed to, uh, given the status of free burgers, um, with the intention, I mean, this was not, you know, a magnanimous gesture on the part of the VOC, uh, with the intention that they would go out and um, uh, make farms uh, in the surrounding countryside and that they would, that Cape Town would become self-sufficient in the sense that it would grow its own food and produce uh, the necessary commodities, right? So these free burgers um, were, were given their autonomy to do that. Um, uh, however, the free burgers themselves remained um, for a very long time closely tied to Cape Town, closely tied to the company, and there was not a lot of distinction between um, the two uh, groups of people. Okay. Um, now, uh, Cape Town grew in population um, within a couple of decades, partly because it became a place to that the, the Dutch government, in cooperation with the VOC, could send, well, for lack of a better term, refugees, um, colonists who had no other place to go. A major group of these, um, a couple hundred or something like that, uh, in the latter part of or in the second half of the 17th century, were French Huguenots or Huguenots. Um, in this sense, Cape Town uh, has something in common with St. Augustine, which also had Huguenot settlers. Uh, Huguenots were French Protestants um, who were forced to flee France after King Louis XIV uh, revoked the Edict of Nantes in 1685 um, and uh, declared that Catholicism would be the only tolerated religion in France, um, and Protestants uh, were then jailed, and, and uh, many of them, maybe most of them, had to flee um, to surrounding countries, especially the Netherlands. Um, well, the Huguenots were a, a problem in a sense. There were lots of them, and so, you know, the Dutch government arranged to have uh, a, a few dozens of these uh, sent off to um, Cape Town to grow the population of the city. Um, within a few decades, there emerged um, uh, a division or a kind of hierarchy of demographics uh, based on both class and gender lines. Um, there, you know, the uh, the higher up officials in the VOC lived almost like uh, landed gentry or or uh, European patricians, while the kind of lower tier company employees barely scraped by. Um, there were always far more men than women in Cape Town. And uh, the, uh, the women were very rarely company employees, only a few of them. Uh, there were some midwives and, and maybe a few uh, domestic laborers, um, though most of that very quickly was done by slaves. Um, but uh, there were very few women, or rather there were a definitely a minority of women. And so this gave the women in the colony actually um, a, a decent legal and social position in that they were much sought after as marriage partners. Uh, women were um, accorded the legal right to inherit property and uh, you know, to have some autonomous status, especially if they were widowed. Um, 
And so this was, was in some ways an advantageous situation for these European women uh, who went off to settle in Cape Town. It was decidedly not an advantageous situation for many or perhaps most of the Africans, um, the, the Aborigines uh, of this land who came into contact with uh, the VOC colony there. Um, and uh, Cape Town very soon became dependent on a system of slavery. Most of the slaves in the VOC colony were not captured uh, from among the peoples of the surrounding countryside. That was not the practice. Rather, they imported slaves from other parts of Africa and eventually some even from parts of Asia, where the Dutch uh, East India Company had a presence. Um, and so there was a, a boatload brought from, um, uh, from West Africa and then another one brought from Angola um, in the latter part of the 17th century, and these were then uh, enslaved and uh, required to do the domestic labor and, and the manual labor. Um, and as I said, Cape Town became quickly dependent on slave labor for most of its productive capacity, and in particular, uh, its farming. Uh, I mentioned these free burgers, you know, were encouraged to uh, uh, to homestead, uh, to make farms, um, but as city dwellers um, and as you know, former employees of the VOC, they really didn't know what they were doing when it came to farming. Um, most of these African slaves had come from, well, pretty much all of them, uh, because most Africans were farmers, uh, had come from farming communities. They knew how to work the land, and so the slaves were the ones who grew the food and, and did most of the labor to keep um, uh, to keep Cape Town running. Um, now, there were a few of these uh, African slaves who managed to obtain freedom. Manumission was not common, uh, but it was not absent entirely either. Uh, however, the free blacks never constituted a very large percentage, maybe at most about 15% of Cape Town uh, into the 18th century. Um, and uh, But there were some free blacks and, and uh, some of them were rather enterprising individuals. Um, one of the most devastating consequences of the formation of Cape Town and the eventual spread of these uh, former company employees into the surrounding countryside and eventually well into the interior uh, of the Cape was that the, um, the former inhabitants of this part of South Africa, um, mostly the Khoi Khoi, uh, these pastoralists, these herders um, of the kind of semi-arid western part of South Africa, you know, this, this area kind of you know, around and west of the Orange River down into the Cape. Uh, this was inhabited mostly by these Khoi Khoi pastoralists. Uh, they were the ones who really suffered from this. Um, as Cape Town spread, as these uh, Dutch and French settlers uh, spread out into the countryside, as they founded new towns uh, within uh, a few decades, towns like Stellenbosch and Parle, um, were founded um, Stellenbosch for sure. I can't remember exactly when Parle was founded, but these are these are close to Cape Town. Um, uh, that uh, you know these these settlements were formed on land that had formerly been used by the Khoikhoi to to herd uh, and pasture their animals. Um, the Khoikhoi often decided to take up uh, employment with you know with the Dutch. Um, uh, the, uh, the Dutch settlers brought in, or they, they purchased cattle in many cases from the Khoi Khoi. In some cases, they stole cattle from them. Um, they often forced them into uh, kind of uh, giving up their cattle um, for a pittance, uh, made conditions very difficult for them, and instead the Khoi Khoi went to work for uh, the Dutch settlers there. Um, so they became laborers, um, both in Cape Town and in the surrounding countryside. In some cases, they were enslaved, uh, but again, most of the slaves came from, from elsewhere. Uh, what was particularly devastating to the Khoi Khoi was uh, the spread of smallpox. 
much has happened um, in the uh, Americas with the Native Americans. Uh, the Khoikhoi had lived far enough removed from the kind of um, Euro-African uh, um, pathological zone that they did not have, they had not been exposed to smallpox, they did not have developed immunities to this, uh, and there were a series of smallpox plagues that, that wiped out large uh, numbers of Khoikhoi. Um, and this devastated the remaining communities. Um, they were forced into an even less advantageous position vis-a-vis -vis the Dutch as a result of this. And the Khoikhoi way of life really uh, took a major hit um, as a result of all of these things, right? Um, and so the Khoikhoi, rather than being independent pastoralist herders, became employees uh, of the Dutch who now owned large uh, herds of cattle, which had formerly belonged to the Khoikhoi, and the Khoikhoi were put into, into, their, into service, as it were. Um, they, they were not, as I said, enslaved for the most part, but their lives were probably not uh, radically different from the, from the lives of the slaves uh, in the same area. Eventually, and this takes a while for this to happen, but eventually as the Dutch spread further and further east, they came into contact with Bantu farmers. Um, the Kosa people uh, specifically uh, had begun to spread uh, across the eastern part of the Cape here, um, uh, across the Fish River. Uh, uh, this is the Fish River. This is the Kaiskama River. Um, across the Fish River. And this is all part of these larger migrations that we will talk about next week. Um, but uh, these Kosa uh, eventually come into contact with the Dutch, and this is going to be... Um, the source of a, a great deal of conflict um, and eventually just outright warfare. Now, a few comments about Cape society um, to conclude this lecture. Um, and, you know, you can read closely in the Thompson book. Um, I would encourage you to read uh, some of the primary sources. Um, uh, one of the, the things that's quite revealing, for instance, and let me just mention this briefly, the very first source in the Williams book um, where Jan van Riebeck talks about uh, a Khoikhoi woman named Eva. Um, as it turns out, you know, the, the Dutch initially were quite friendly with some of these Khoikhoi, and the Khoikhoi uh, saw them, and th this is where we have to find African agency. You know, in pre-modern Africa, there, there's always this assumption that the Europeans are, are inherently superior, and they have, you know, they're, they're tech there's a technological gap. That they're always going to take advantage of the Africans who were callow and, and uh, uh, kind of naive um, and gullible. Um, well, I think that we need to read these more generously, these sources more generously vis-a-vis -vis the Africans. And, and I think what we see here in this very first source is a Khoikhoi woman named Eva who sees that there are conflicts between various groups of Khoikhoi and that um, these Dutch settlers can be exploited or you know, alliances can be formed with them that will be advantageous for particular groups of Khoikhoi uh, to help them kind of overcome their rivals, right? Um, so that seems to be what's ha partly what's happening in this source where Jan van Riebeck describes uh, this woman named Eva. Um, one of the things that stands out, I think, in this source uh, is where uh, von Riebeck says, it talks about the cattle herds uh, among the Khoikhoi. Uh, I'm on page nine of the Williams book. Um, the cattle were so numerous that no end to them could be seen. In half a day, they would clear all the pastures within the whole circumference of the Cape and whatever besides the company and free men possessed. I mean, I don't know if he's exaggerating here, but uh, there's, there seem to have been very large cattle herds. Um, and he concludes by saying, in short, this was a very powerful nation. He's talking about the Khoikhoi here. Rich in cattle and able, so they said, to drive the Kopmans into their holes if they wish. And he's, you know, he's talking about a particular uh, group of Khoikhoi who um, were, again, the rivals of another group of Khoikhoi. Um, uh, and so there's some kind of awe expressed by this uh, European governor about how large uh, the cattle herds are. Um, another source that I particularly 
uh, thought was important here. I mean, all the ones I assigned, I think, have their uh, their merits, and you should certainly look at all of those. Um, but uh, the source starts on page 49 of the Williams book. Um, this is uh, one of the sources, one of the accounts. There's actually two or three of these documents in this book. Uh, this is a, um, a Swedish traveler named Anders Sparman uh, who visited Southern Africa um, and uh, traveled across it. And this is the one where he is uh, interacting with the Tosa. Um, and you can see, uh, you know, a couple of things going on in this source. One is a kind, again, a kind of awe um, at the capabilities of these Africans, but that is coupled with um, what I think has to be called the European fear of Africans because they're so different. The Europeans saw them as nothing more than savages uh, in a certain sense, right? So he says on page 52, bottom of page 52, I cannot help thinking, however, that the instances we have of the deceitful dispositions of the barbarians in general, and he's talking about the Tosa here, and of the sudden transitions which are sometimes made by them from a state of peace and tranquility to that of ra uh, rapine and slaughter, are sufficient to justify all our suspicions and the precautions we took with respect to them. And I am cl inclined to consider the, uh, the being massacred by these fellows as one of the species of the sudden death against which we are taught to pray in the litany, right? And so he uh, is obviously very afraid of them um, and uh, assumes that at any moment they're just going to erupt and kill him and all of his people, right? Um, I, uh, and, you know, this is, this is part of the calculus that goes into analyzing um, the interactions between the Europeans and the Africans. Um, uh, that, you know, the, the Europeans assume that these are savages who are uh, just wild people and they're, you know, they would just as soon kill you as look at you. And I think, you know, if we were to try to read between the lines and get the um, perspective of the Africans, they are just as concerned about these strange, pale people who have come into their presence um, and, uh, you know, were worried about the potential for destruction they might cause to their society. But in the meantime, you know, they're trading with each other, right? They, they both have things that the other wants, and so they're willing to kind of set aside their fears uh, in order to take advantage of the situation that they're offered there. Uh, Cape Society um, was, until the late 18th century, determined in large part by the presence of the VOC. Um, there was this, a pretty sharp distinction between company and non-company men, um, in terms of kind of stability and support and all of that. Um, but some of these non-company men, uh, you know, partly as a result of the advantages that were accrued to those who were employees of the company, uh, expressed, began to express a desire to leave um, Cape Town, leave even the vicinity of Cape Town and to head out into the wilderness and to, you know, try to eke out an existence for themselves. And so, you know, uh, we begin to see um, kind of enterprising spirit among the Dutch, uh, where they, they move further and further inland. Of course, they, they did this uh, with the help of slaves, or largely reliant on their slaves, and they you know, continued to uh, take slaves from among the, um, the local population. Um, I talked about gender issues already. Uh, another one that occurs to me is that, um, uh, that I should have mentioned, um, is the massive gap gender gap among the slaves. There were always far, far more slaves uh, who were men than women. And, uh, you know, this had serious consequences for that society. Um, the, uh, the lot of, uh, of all the slaves, but certainly, especially the women, uh, must have been horrendous. Uh, they were, you know, used for breeding purposes. They did not have any claim to their children. Um, the kind of heartbreak that must have uh, occurred when, you know, these children were taken away from them, um, when, you know, these slave women were um, subjected to all manner of harsh treatment, to, to rape, um, and all of these things. I think we have to, you know, see the atrocities where they are there. Um, and a lot of that comes from this, this massive divide in gender. There were, you know, three or four times as many male slaves as there were female slaves um, through the whole existence of uh, of the Dutch Cape Colony. 
And the social divisions really began to emerge um, between the races. This is the origins. This period sees the origins of the endemic racism that characterizes South African history. Already in the in the 17th and early 18th centuries, the Europeans insisted on you know being addressed with titles of, or with uh, labels of respect by the Africans. Uh, the term "boss." Uh, was applied to all Europeans and uh, it was required almost for the Africans to call Europeans boss. Um, this would, this practice and that word in particular would continue uh, into the 20th and uh, you know up to the end of the 20th century um, and so that, that word has a long history to it. Um, the uh, Given the, the gender imbalances among the Europeans, uh, given the availability of um, native women uh, who were often prostituted, um, and of course the availability of, of slave women who um, were exploited in all, all manner of horrendous ways, there was a great deal of sexual contact between Europeans and Africans. And most of this, the vast majority of it, was between uh, European men and African women, whether the enslaved women or the Khoikhoi or um, eventually the Bantus, right? Um, thus, we see the beginnings of a mixed race community of people that is going to become an important factor in South African history um, and uh, one that, uh, you know, has um, a unique and it might be said, troubled uh, position in South African society, right? Um, the uh, children of a slave master uh, by a slave woman were legally slaves. However, they were more likely to be manumitted than uh, an imported slave was. Um, but, uh, you know, the the European masters did not necessarily claim, you know, their own children as uh, legitimate children um, and continued to treat them as slaves. Um, anyway, this is, this is the origins of, you know, what come to be called in South Africa the Griqua or uh, more commonly but somewhat pejoratively the colored community uh, of South Africa. Okay. Um, Starting in the, the late 17th and early 18th centuries, um, many of the settlers uh, began to sort of spread their wings even further. Um, in some cases, they were given commissions by the company to do this. Um, but this is the, um, the phenomenon of the trek boer. And you can read about it in the Thompson book. Um, these are the uh, kind of pioneering settlers who spread further and further from Cape Town, um, and in fact, all the way over here into the Bantu zone, right, where they began to have conflicts with them. Um, uh, thus, by the end of the 18th century, there were Dutch settlers all across the Cape in all of the habitable lands. Um, Trek Boers survived mostly by herding cattle. They, they, their lives were not appreciably different from those of the Khoi Khoi, except they may have built uh, European style houses and things. Um, in some cases they, they did farming, um, but they, they owned large cattle herds. Uh, the Trek Boers, like others, maybe even more so, um, uh, earned their living, I, but that's not the right terminology. Uh, their entire economy was based on slave labor, right? Um, that was fundament, a fundamental institution for them. Uh, without the slaves, the Trek Boers could not have done what they did, not have traveled to the places they did, have the, the numbers of cattle they did, right? So the Trek Boers were even more kind of deep in uh, the institution of slavery than, than the other D Dutch settlers were. Um, as a result of this European movement all across the Cape, um, these mixed race people, and in some cases uh, escaped slaves, um, and in some cases kind of disenfranchised or disinherited Khoi Khoi, began to form settlements to the north and northeast uh, up here uh, around the Orange River uh, and even points beyond that. 
Um, and the, they, they founded independent communities where they continued to mix with each other. Um, and so there was a, a good deal more of a melting pot here even than there was in the Cape. Um, and uh, they began to call themselves Griqua. Um, and again, this is, you know, the, the more common but pejorative name is colored. That is not to be confused with the Bantus who uh, in South Africa are called the Blacks, um, uh, but the Coloreds, right? Um, their identity is complex. The Griqua, for the most part, spoke Dutch or what was becoming a modified form of Dutch what was on its way to becoming the language of Afrikaans. Um, most of them were converted to Christianity, but they did not feel welcome in European society, and they also felt some hostility from the Bantus. Uh, in some cases, they did become clients of the Bantus. In some cases, they even assimilated with them, right? So we don't have strict divisions between the different peoples. Uh, but these Greek would began to have their own independent existence. And that uh, unique identity would remain in place uh, to some extent all the way to the present, right? Um, so we'll keep track of this group as we go forward with the class. Christianity, even though the Dutch were Christian nominally, uh, religion did not have a tremendous impact on the society of the Cape in the 17th and 18th centuries. Not until the very end of the 18th century when missionary societies from Europe, uh, inspired by a kind of evangelical revival, um, began to make their way into Southern Africa. Uh, only then does Christianity become a tremendously important factor in the development of the society. Um, uh, so even though these, you know, the, these Dutch settlers sort of come out of the religious atmosphere of the early 17th century in Europe, the Protestant Reformation and all of that, by, by the time even Jan van Riebeck settles in South Africa, much of that has run its course. The Dutch were almost all Calvinists, and Calvinism itself uh, did not evince a great concern with missionizing, evangelizing, converting large numbers of people because Calvinism uh, has, holds to the doctrine of um, uh, predestination, right? That if God wants to save you, he will have predestined to save you. And chances are these native Africans, I mean, from the Calvinist viewpoint, these native Africans are not predestined to be saved. So why even take concern about them, about converting them to Christianity. Most, many of them do become Christian converts eventually. Uh, but this Calvinism is a, a rather, shall we say, unforgiving way uh, to, to, to see the world. And I, I don't mean to criticize any, any form of belief here, right? But uh, Calvinism seems to be particularly adept at, at things like colonizing and at uh, major mercantile enterprises because it was not overly concerned with uh, with proselytizing and converting people. Okay, um, so that takes us up through, um, I mean, and I, I've left a lot out here, of course, I'm trying to keep these uh, somewhat short. Um, that takes us up through kind of the, uh, the latter part of the 18th century. Um, we need to deal with the uh, incursion of the British after this, um, uh, but we'll do that in the next lecture. Thank you.